One particular theologian who has been influencing me greatly over the last couple of months is a theologian who unfortunately is not very well known, and that is the Reverend William J. And today I'm going to be reviewing his book, The Christian Contemplated. Before we dive into anything further, um, any links to books that I mention in this video will be in the description down below. This book is a 475 page book. It is cloth bound or some kind of paper hardcover book. I cannot tell which. Um, I think it's cloth bound, but it doesn't feel like cloth. So I'm not sure what it is exactly, but it has this beautiful um, cover and this is the spine here, just absolutely gorgeous. It, it has uh, this rose gold uh, lettering and it's kind of this purple color to it. And it also includes this, uh, it's, it's kind of so-so, but it has a ribbon in it. Uh, it's pink, which kind of matches the rose gold lettering. Um, it is also Smith sewn. It is really, really well made, um, just really well made. And on top of that, it reads extremely, extremely easily. And the reason that is, is because it has a huge, huge typeface. I think this is like a 14, maybe 15 point font. And the, uh, the preface is even larger. This must be like an 18 or 20 point font. It's absolutely massive. So easy to read. And so you read essentially two pages to a single page. So it feels like a 200 page book when it's really 475. So you read a lot in a very short amount of time, which is very nice. Um, if you're new, let me welcome you to Petra Publications. My name is Davis. And here on the channel, basically I just re uh, review reformed Christian books, though uh, sometimes I do step out of that realm and may upload a review of a book that's not even Christian if it was edifying to me and I want to share that with you. Uh, if you've been following uh, the channel for a little while now, I welcome you to look in the description down below where I've linked to my Patreon and PayPal if you'd like to support me. Thank you so much. Uh, so now I'm going to dive into a little bit of information about the Reverend Jay. Uh, he was born on May 6th of 1769, and he died on December 27th of 1853. Uh, he, he worked alongside uh, his father, who was a stonemason, until the year 1785, when he left his father to pursue education and the ministry. In 1791, he married his wife, Annie, with whom he had six children. Throughout his life, he maintained his close relationships or, and close friendships with uh, both William Wilberforce and John Newton, who, of course, are prevalent people at that time, and still even today, great theologians. Um, he had very poor health near the end of his life and died at the age of 84. And something that's so clear about this time in history is that um, he was a contemporary of Spurgeon, he was a contemporary of Ryle, and all three of those men, including, I guess, William Wilberforce and John Newton, you see this common feature of a focus on evangelism. You see a common focus on spreading the gospel to the entire world. And so, in light of that, Jay was a nonconformist preacher who preached from one pulpit, one pulpit for 60 years at Ar Argyle Chapel in Bath. Uh, and even before that, he had preached um, from a church, uh, a couple different churches. He preached for a year at one and another year at another. And so he had preached some 1,000 sermons uh, before he came to the church he preached 60 years at, which is insane. Um, but this is the part I was going to get to with all of that, all that to say. He preached to all men in all places of all denominations. He preached to rich and poor. He preached to black and white. He preached to everyone that would hear his voice. Because all humans have a soul and all humans need to hear the gospel. And you see that everywhere. In, in that time period, you have Spurgeon, who was a Baptist, preached to everyone. You had Ryle, who was an Anglican, preached to everyone. Um, very evangelical, just wonderful. And so, in light of all of that historical context, now we can dive into the book itself. And the C Christian Contemplated focuses on 13 different topics. And in each one of those, it answers the question, what should the Christian be doing in fill in the blank. And so 
Uh, I'm going to read the table of contents here in the here in a moment, but it's such a helpful book, so practical, so applicable to life. It takes a doctrine. It's almost it's almost like reading a sermon, but only reading the application to the sermon, but the entire sermon is the application. And it's so good. It's so biblical. It's so based on the scriptures. And uh, it's so practical and applicable to life, even though it's 200 years old. Um, so I'm now going to read the table of contents. <clears throat> if I can get to it, there it is. So each one is the Christian in, and so I'm not going to read the Christian 13 times. but So it's the Christian in Christ, in the closet, in the family, in the church, in the world, in prosperity, in adversity, in, in his spiritual sorrows, in his spiritual joys, in death, in the grave, in heaven. And then the final is the result. Um, one thing uh, that's interesting about the back of this book, this final chapter here, I showed you the way the text looks in most of the sermons here. Uh, the last one, um, number 13, the result it's in an entirely different typeface with an entirely different size and an entirely different uh, setup here. You can see there's a wider margin at the bottom here. And uh, I'm not sure why that is. Uh, the text block itself was taken from an 1835 edition. And from what I can tell, this last chapter was not in that edition. So I'm not sure if it was added later or what exactly happened there. Uh, doesn't take away anything from the book, but I did think it was interesting and worth mentioning. Um, so typically at this point in the review, I would answer or ask the question, are there any better books on this topic? And, um, you know, there are other books on this topic. It's very uh, just practical Christian living. Uh, such such a book would be like The Christian's Reasonable Service by Brackle. Uh, a lot of other Puritan works. Uh, Puritans were very practical people, um, very much on the application so yeah, there are lots of other books. I'm not sure there is a better one. This is a single volume book that just focuses on the Christian's living. How does a Christian live in all of these different contexts? So I think uh, as far as I know, and as far as I've read, there isn't a better book on this topic. I'm going to go with that. And so would I buy the book? Yes. Um, this book is very difficult to get your hands on uh, because Petra Publications is going out of business or did go out of business. And so the only ones available left out there are the ones that were printed prior to that. Um, also, I was supposed to mention this earlier, um, but uh, if you want to know more about William J. than I had mentioned, uh, uh, what is this? Sprinkle Publications also published um, his autobiography. So you can pick that up as well if you can find it. And I will link to uh, the books down below, but I can't guarantee that they will stay in stock for very long. Uh, but yes, I would highly, highly recommend buying it. It's so helpful. It's so practical and applicable to life, as I've said now uh, multiple, multiple times. Uh, but don't take my word for it alone. I'm going to now read some quotes from the book that I pulled out as I read it. And so, obviously, keep in mind, these are coming from different chapters, so they're going to be topically different. But the first is from uh, the, the Christian in the Closet, <clears throat> and uh, it's from page 43. And he says, Christians, however, should get as much leisure time for the closet as they are able. And in order to do this, they should guard against the waste of time. They should economize time. They should redeem time for indecision and trifling and especially from the vile and wretched consumptions of unnecessary sleep. Um, so good. Often I waste time. Um, <laughs> I waste time in indecision. I waste time in trifling, and I waste time from unneeded sleep. And so here he's saying, you have all this leisure time, now use it for the closet. And uh, on page 51, he quotes from a Mrs. Barry's diary, and I, I'm not sure who that is, uh, but what she had to say was extremely good. She said, I would not be hired out of my closet for 1,000 words. I never enjoy such hours of pleasure, 
and such free and entire communion with God as I have here. And I wonder that any can live prayerless and deprive themselves of the great privileges allowed to them. And how true that is. We have the privilege to approach boldly to the throne of grace and pray to him at any time, anywhere, being anyone at all. Like, the deepest and most grotesque of sinners can approach God boldly. And the most holy Christian should be approaching God boldly through Christ. And what a privilege that is, and yet we, we treat it like it's nothing. And, yeah, that's a very helpful quote there. Page 58, he says, this is so good. I actually, I teared up when I read this the first time. I, it says, Do children dread to enter a room where a loved and honored father is to be found? Would not this be a sufficient attraction to enter it? When shall I come, says David, and appear before God? Just think about that for a minute. The, like God should be loved and honored, and therefore that is our motivation to go into the closet and pray. To, to enter into prayer and communion with him. It's, it's so beautiful. It's so good. He's so gracious, so kind, so merciful. And yet, we don't even treat God like, like we would our fathers here. It's terrible. Page 70, he says, He who despises his own soul will feel little disposition to attend the souls of others. Destitute of principles... He will be determined only by circumstances, and his exertions, if any, if he makes any, will be partial and rare. <clears throat> Page 84 and 85, this is very good. He says, Were you to suffer your children to go naked, to perish with hunger, were you to leave them in sickness to die alone, you would be shunned as monsters. But you are far more deserving of execra execration if you infamously disregard their spiritual and everlasting welfare. It's so true. Today, I think most parents, and I can't critique a lot of parenting, I, I don't have children myself. Lord willing, I will one day. Uh, but as of right now, I don't. But it seems like so many parents focus on the house they will grow up in, the friends they will have, the school they will go to, the sports they will play, the clothes they will wear. And yet they disregard entirely their spiritual development and their spiritual life. And yet that is so much more important than anything here that is earthly. Page 120, he says, The public worship of God ought always to be considered as an unspeakable benefit to mankind. Page 154, he says, Thus, Secular life is Christianized and the bounds of religion enlarged far beyond the district, district of what we commonly mean by devotion. And uh, I'm not sure why he sounded so post-millennial there, but I'm not entirely opposed to it. Uh, page 174 and 75, he says, Nothing recommends godliness more than cheerfulness. All men desire happiness, and if while every other candidate for the prize fails, you succeed... Your success may determine others to follow your envied course. So Christians, be cheerful. Rejoice. We have reason to. Go and live it. Perhaps others will follow in behind you. And on page 177 and 178, he, uh, he was talking about, uh, it was the, the Christian in the world, and chapter 5. And he says, uh, you know, he's talking about women um, in the church. And he says, you know, okay, so you have gifts, perhaps. Perhaps you have a desire, a longing to teach and to preach. Um, and, and he essentially says, it doesn't matter. Um, you may be good at it, but it's irrelevant. God has given us this command. We are to follow it. And in so doing, we are honoring and glorifying him. And I thought that was very, very good and insightful and not at all how we would uh, like to view that text today, I, I am shameful to say. But uh, at any rate, page 234, he says, Nothing less is required of you as Christians than a willing, cheerful resignation, but this is, can only flow from a knowledge of him that smiteth you. 
I believe that came from uh, the Christian in the grave. So he's talking about resignation as in death. Uh, just a few more here. Um, he says, The effects of these trials, therefore, are always humbling to the Christian. He is always convinced by them that he has much less grace than he imagined. He has often rendered a wonder as well as a grief to himself. And then page 279, this is very helpful as well. He says, Rise early. Take proper exercise. Beware of sloth. Sloth. Observe and avoid whatever disagrees with your system. Never overburden nature. Be moderate in your table indulgences and let not appetite bemire the, and clog the mind. So, very helpful stuff there. That's just practical advice for everyone. Uh, rise early, even before the sun uh, gets up. Exercise and get strong. Grow your body. Um, you know, use it. God gave it to you. Now, do something with it. Um, observe and avoid what disagrees with your system. Don't do things that are bad for your body uh, and bad for your soul and your mental uh, health. Never overburden nature. Don't take on more than you can handle. And be moderate in your table indulgences. Don't eat more than you should. Don't don't become fat. Um, and, and and then don't don't clog and bemire the mind with appetites of pleasure and you know seeking of worthless goods. Um, and then on uh, page three eighty six, he says, "When you think of the grave." Remember that Jesus himself has been there. How far did he, who is all your salvation and all your desire, carry his humiliation? That is so good. And then to close out this review, I have a quote here. Um, there's a poem on page 402, and there's lots of poetry throughout this book, which is just really wonderful. But um, this particular one, I thought I would close out the review in. He says... <clears throat> Oft I have heard, this is actually, this is quoting a, uh, some kind of a psalmist here. He says, Oft I have heard thy threatening, threatenings roar, and oft endured the grief. And when thy hand hath pressed me sore, thy grace was my relief. By long experience I have known thy sovereign power to save. At thy command I ventured down securely to the grave. When I lie buried deep in dust, my flesh shall be thy care. Those withering limbs with thee I trust to raise them strong and fair. To that I say amen and amen. Well, that is all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching to the end of the video. If this review is helpful to you, I'd love to hear from you in the comments section down below. Um, yeah, that's all I have. So Lord willing, I will see you again very soon. God bless. Bye.